At this point, we've covered two different ways to find limits of a function. One way is by looking at a graph, and the other is by looking at a table. If you're not sure how to find the limit using a graph or table, I'd encourage you to watch my 1.3 and 1.4 videos where I cover those topics. 1.5 is all about finding limits algebraically, sometimes through direct substitution. Direct substitution is plugging the c value, which is our limit value, directly into f of x, the function, to evaluate the limit. For example, to, in order to find the limit of 3x plus 5 as x approaches 7 by using direct substitution, what we would do is substitute 7 in for x. So we would write 3 times 7 plus 5, get 21 plus 5, which is equal to 26. And that means that the limit as x goes to 7 of 3x plus 5 is equal to 26. Direct substitution is a really convenient way to find the limit, but it only works for continuous functions, functions that do not have asymptotes or holes or breaks in the graph or anything like that. So this means that we cannot use direct substitution to find limits for piecewise functions and typically not for rational functions. There are specific situations for rational functions where you can, but we're going to dive into which rational functions it's okay to use direct substitution for later in the video. So for now, let's take a look at this example. We're trying to find the limit of this function as x approaches 1. Let's try using direct substitution to see what happens. If we substitute 1 in for x, we'll get 1 squared minus 9 times 1 plus 8 all over 1 minus 1. I don't really care what the numerator is here. We're just going to get a number in the numerator. But what I care about here is the denominator, 1 minus 1 over 0. Dividing by zero is a big red flag when we are working with any kind of rational function because when you divide by zero, it means that a number does not exist. We can't divide by zero, that's undefined. But even some functions where we divide by zero, that doesn't mean that there's not a limit at the point, that just means that there's no actual value for the function at that point. Remember, what we care about in a limit is what the function is approaching, not what it actually is. So if we are trying to take a look at why this happens, let's factor the numerator to see why we get something over zero here. So if we factor the numerator, we would get x minus eight times x minus one all over x minus one. And then when we have a common factor in the top and the bottom, we can cancel those. And when we cancel out a factor, that means that there's a whole. So at x minus one equals zero or at x equals one, we are going to have a hole in the graph. And that, do, that hole does show up on our graph here. That means that there's no actual value for if we plug in x equals 1 to this function. As we saw, it produces something that's undefined. However, a limit can exist at a hole. A limit is talking about what the function is approaching as we get to this point. It's not asking what the function actually is. We are not trying to find f of 1 we are trying to find the limit as x approaches 1. So that's why we cannot always use direct substitution for rational functions, because it's going to provide an answer that's not, that's not at all clear. It's going to say something over 0. Do not write does not exist, because the limit here does exist. If we're, if we're looking at the right side, it looks like from the right side, f of x is approaching negative 7 as x approaches 1, and from the left side it's approaching negative 7 as x approaches 1. So the actual limit here is negative 7, but we would not have been able to find that through direct substitution. This is why it is very important that we are aware of the holes and the vertical asymptotes when we deal with the limits of rational functions. To prevent these kinds of issues from happening, we need to factor first. And by these kinds of issues, I just mean getting something like 0 over 0, or really anything over 0, where it would be undefined. So let's take a look at this, at this problem here. I'm trying to find the limit of this function as x goes to negative 2. Before I do anything, I'm going to factor. This is going to turn into, and I still have my limit notation out front because I haven't, I haven't changed anything in here. Um, I'm, just going, I'm just going to factor in here. I haven't plugged anything in yet. So I have x plus 2 over x minus x plus 2 times x minus 1. 
Now, at this point, I see that I have a common factor in the numerator and the denominator, and that common factor is x plus 2. When I have a common factor, that indicates a whole. I know that there's a whole at x plus 2 equals 0, or x equals negative 2. So even though this is the number that I'm trying to find the limit of, remember that it's okay for a limit to exist at a whole. The problem here would be if this was a vertical asymptote, because if I'm dealing with a vertical asymptote, then it's probably going to be going up to infinity or down to negative infinity, in which case the answer would be does not exist. But because this is a whole, I don't need to worry about that. So what I'm going to do next, I'm going to do limit as x goes to negative 2 of 1 over x minus 1. And now I'll use direct substitution. I'm going to plug in negative 2 into this function. It becomes 1 over negative 2 minus 1 or 1 over negative 3, which is the same thing as negative 1 third. So that is the limit of my function. Here I have another example of a rational function where I'm trying to find the limit. So normally I would factor first, but this function is all the way factored already. So I'm going to go ahead and see what my vertical asymptotes and my holes are to see if the limit that I'm trying to find is near those. So it looks like here, if, I, if I'm trying to find my vertical asymptotes, I set my denominator equal to 0. So I have a vertical asymptote at x equals negative 3. Unfortunately, this is the exact value that I'm trying to find for the limit, which means that I can't use direct substitution because I would get something over 0, and that's undefined. So I'm going to need to use a table instead. So let me just grab my graphing calculator, and I'm going to plug in. I'm going to plug in my new function negative 2 over x plus 3, go to my table, and I'm going to plug in values that are close to negative 3, negative 3.1, negative 3.01, negative 3.001, and it looks like what I'm approaching here, I'm going 20, 200, 2000, so I'm getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and if I were to plug in one that's even closer to negative 3, I would do negative 3.0001, and that's going to give me 20,000. So I'm getting bigger and bigger from the left side. Let's see what's happening on the right side. Negative 2.9, negative 2.99, negative 2.999, negative 2.9999. So as I'm getting closer and closer here, I'm not very close, but down here I'm much closer to negative 3. Um, what's actually happening here is that I'm going, um, I'm going more towards negative infinity. From the left side, I'm going to positive infinity. And from the right side, I'm going to negative infinity. Not only do those limits not match, but anytime that we have infinity as a limit, that means that the limit actually does not exist because that's unbounded behavior. So the limit of this function does not exist. Limit properties can make limits easier to simplify. For example, we have this property that the limit of f of x plus g of x as x goes to p is equal to the limit of f of x as x goes to p plus the limit of g of x as x goes to p. So essentially what this is saying is that you can break apart, um, you can break apart any of your limit terms inside here into two separate terms with the same limit out front, and that, that will be equal. Um, the same concept applies for subtraction and for multiplication and division. Division, um, that's kind of the anomaly though, because we want to make sure that we're being really, really careful with division, because that's when we're dealing with the rational functions. So we have to be careful of holes and vertical asymptotes there. So let's practice this first example here, using limit properties to break our limit apart into separate pieces before using direct substitution. So I have limit of 4x squared minus 5x plus 9 as x approaches 8. And what I'm going to do is using my limit properties, I'm going to break this into three separate limits that I'm going to simplify individually. So I'm going to break this into limit of 4x squared as x approaches 8. And then I have a minus sign in between here. So I'm going to do minus the limit as x goes to 8 of 5x plus the limit as x goes to 8 of 9. Now, since all of these are continuous functions, I'm going to plug in 8 using direct substitution. 4x squared is a continuous function that is a quadratic, so I'm going to plug in 4 times 8 squared. So I get 4 times 64. 
and I'm going to keep that in parentheses. And then I'm going to get minus, and then I'm going to worry about this one. So now I'm going to use direct substitution for the limit of 5x as x approaches 8. Instead of 5x, it's going to be 5 times 8, which is 40. And then this very last one, limit of 9 as x approaches 8. 9, we can think of that as the function y equals 9. Um, that's also a continuous function. So no matter what our x value is here, the y value is always going to be 9. So we just plug in 9 there. And then I'm going to grab my calculator and evaluate 4 times 64 minus 40 plus 9. And I get 225. So my overall limit for this one is 225. Now, I know that it seems a little bit um, redundant to break it into these separate pieces because you could just use direct substitution right off the bat um, and do something like 4 times 8 squared minus 5 times 8 plus 9. Um, but what we're doing here is kind of proving, proving that these properties work because now when you see, now when you see something like this in the future, you don't have to rewrite out all this limit notation. You can just skip straight to here, which is the same step as this one. Okay. So for our last example on this page, um, this is a multiplication one. We have the limit of this function as X approaches negative two. So I'm going to split this into two separate functions that are multiplied by one another or two separate limits to evaluate. So I have the limit of x squared plus 4 as x approaches negative 2 times the limit of x approaching negative 2 of 2x minus 2. And now I could break this apart even further and do limit of x squared as x goes to negative 2 plus limit of 4 as x goes to negative 2, but I'm just going to use direct substitution at this point. I'm going to do, and then once you actually plug the number in, once you actually plug in negative 2 for x, that limit, that word limit out in the front can go away. So I'm doing negative 2 squared plus 4, that's all in parentheses, times 2 times negative 2 minus 2. And now I evaluate 4 plus 4, which is 8, times negative 4 minus 2, so times negative 6, that is negative 48. So my limit here is equal to negative 48. That means that as x approaches negative 2, if I were to have a graph of this function, as x was approaching negative 2, the f of x value or the y value would approach negative 48. Okay, I have another rational function going on here. So what I'm going to have to do is factor first, and I'm keeping my limit notation on here. You always keep the limit notation on until you physically plug in the number by direct substitution. So I have the limit as x goes to 2 of negative x minus 2 times x plus 1 all over x minus 2. I have a hole here. I can cancel factors in the top and bottom, and I have a hole at x equals 2. However, now that I've canceled out the common factor, what I can do is simplify this into limit as x goes to 2 of x plus 1, sorry, of negative x plus 1, because we have that negative sign out at the beginning. Um, now, that I, now that I no longer have the thing that would cause it to be something over 0 if I plugged in 2, I'm allowed to use direct substitution. I just have to be mindful of the fact that there is a hole at x equals negative 2. So now I'm actually going to plug in my value, so the limit notation can go away, but I have negative parentheses 2 plus 1, which is negative 3. Cube roots are continuous functions, and so are square roots. So in both of these cases, I'm allowed to use direct substitution to find my limit. So I'm going to rewrite this as the square root of 3 times 6 minus 2, which is equal to the square root of 18 minus 2, or the square root of 16 which is 4. In this case down here, cube roots are also continuous functions, so it's okay to use direct substitution. I'm going to directly plug in x equaling 0 into this function. I'm going to rewrite this as the cube root of negative 1 fourth times 0 plus 8, which is equal to the cube root of 8, which is also equal to 2. 